Welcome to the Wet Pastel channel. Today you're going to see how you take a plein air work and take it into the studio and do the finishing touches. I will start out by showing some of the process at location at a nature preserve and then we'll bring that piece back into the studio and how you make those finishing touches. Anyone who's competed in plein air competitions knows that they often have a 100% rule. You have to have 100% of the piece done on location to submit that piece for that competition. Or sometimes they'll say 80% uh, of it has to have been done on location, or 95%. Uh, how they come up with those percentages varies, but basically I'm going to show you how if you enjoy plein air, enjoy going out, but you're not really happy with the finished piece and you want to bring it back into the studio, it's perfectly okay when you're not using it as a competition piece. So let's get started. I'll show you how that's done. Oh, before we start, if you're enjoying the content of the Wet Pastel channel, please hit the like button. If you haven't subscribed, please do that. But at least hit the like button. That lets others who are trying to find this content find it more easily. So let's get started on that demonstration. This is the tree screen that I found at the reserve. And I took that tree screen and I blocked it in on a piece of UART sanded 400. Then after that particular point, I began putting some wet pastel techniques to use uh, because I wanted a higher texture than what the UART would give me. So here I'm basically adding between, starting with the light areas first, I'm, I'm adding uh, clear gesso. And it's mixing with some of those pastel uh, yellows and yellow oranges and red oranges uh, to create a uh, background that over that I then, uh, I then painted the different colors that I wanted to build up uh, later. I'll show you that here in a second. Speeding this up a little bit, you'll see how uh, blending that wet material into this, I start to form some of the tree branches. It takes a little while for that gesso to dry depending on how the temperatures are and the humidity outside. So here I check it and once it's dry enough then I start adding some additional colors rather than the basic colors that established the um, outline or the underpainting. I think it's important that you understand before I go into the studio and explain that process how I got to the point where I brought it into the studio. I'm taking this to about 90%, 95% uh, finished at this event. It wasn't a competition or anything. It was a demonstration. At this point, let me fast forward this so that you can see the addition of the uh, finer colors and the harmonizing colors as I broke this into uh, the tree screen. I diverted at this particular point from what I was seeing to what the painting was telling me. I had to move some of the branches of the trees and move them inward because that particular tree screen, the edge branches, wanted to go out and move the eye outside of the picture. So I'm doing that. So let's speed this up and you'll see the additions. I'm able to get more color into this. I uh, was in the violets and the oranges and I'd be adding the blues and refining and making areas. I'm also adding some direction. Uh, tree screens are notoriously difficult because everything goes horizontally. This is pretty typical of my outdoor work when I do a plein air is I block things in and then start the refinement and adding that compositional elements. I'm adding uh, those wedges down there to move the eye across and then another uh, area that has a very slight wedge to it to create a compositional movement. At this point I also determined that on the left hand side uh, in the one third area I was going to add just a little bit more bright color before I finish this. 
and you'll see some of that in the studio when we go inside for this. This still frame gives you a little bit better idea of how the color is developing. It's past the blocking stage. Uh, there's a lot more to do here. This was about an hour and a half into it, and I spent another hour and a half uh, to take it to a finish. This was about a three hour event because a lot of people uh, talked to me during the event, but it could have been done much faster. I'll slow it down here again. You can see as I near the finish uh, at the location, I'm putting a little more detail, trying to get a little more of the definition in between the brand. Again, the outside light uh, isn't really good. It's a pretty blue. This is more realistic to the colors that uh, people saw in this still frame. So that's uh, what we're going to take into the studio and work on from that point. All right, we bring this back into the studio and at this particular point, what we are trying to do is get to where we're doing only about 90% uh, in the studio, refining some of the places that we have already uh, put in place on location, brightening up some areas. Uh, at the end, I'll show you a still, a still photo that will show you how much brighter it really is as opposed to the, the um, filming of this. The filming, for some reason, uh, tends to have the colors a little duller than they really are and the contrast a little lower. So here I'm taking what was already done outside and I'm just sharpening it up edges in places. I'm creating some uh, indentations for the trees to be um, more layered, more individual, and look more like trees. They really uh, were kind of blobs at this particular point, but it's interesting to see how we can um, get those into place. I know earlier in the video I said that uh, a lot of places have a 100% requirement on location. Yeah, and others have, uh, you know, 90, 95%. It doesn't really matter. This piece isn't for competition. So even if I only reached 80% outside and decided to do more inside, uh, it's up to you as an artist how much of this you want to do outside. I am not a plein air painter in the sense that I do really well finishing things outside. I'm never satisfied with the finish outside. So I don't care if I come in the studio after doing something. If the piece has promise, then basically I want to continue to work on it and create something that I'll be satisfied with. So uh, as long as it's not for competition, uh, I'm not breaking any rules, whether I do 20% inside, 50% inside, or 80% uh, inside, and just start, start something outside. But be aware, uh, if you are doing this, uh, maybe you are part of a plein air group and you're wanting to do this uh, work and you want to stay within the rules, check out your rules first and determine, you know, how much do I have to finish outside before I take it inside and get it finished. Uh, that last 5 or 10 percent or whatever your association or your competition allows. I was the president of the Indiana Plein Air Painters Association, known as IPAPA, and we've uh, had many events and allow uh, most of the time 90% to be done outside and 10% to be done inside. But what was never defined, are they talking about 10% additional time? Are they talking about 10% uh, additional pastel added? Uh, there's no real definitions when you see these things on competitions. Well, you know, if they say, you know, you can do 10% inside or 5% inside, what is that? Is that time? Is that pastel? Uh, it's up to each individual person to determine what is fair, and uh, they're very vague guidelines. So if you are in competition, uh, kind of try to figure out, you know, are you spending 10% more time uh, inside or applying just 10% finishing touches, like some highlights and darkening some shadows. 
So there's no real clear definition that I've seen in any of the competitions that either we had or that I uh, was entered in when I used to do more plein air than I do now. But again, if you're doing this for yourself, just have fun. That's the whole point. Uh, get it to where you want it uh, and use the outside to learn to see. That's the advantage to plein air painting as far as I'm concerned. You can see those light violets, uh, almost lilac trees that are off in the distance behind this tree screen. Uh, in the original photograph at the beginning of this, they were just like any other landscape that if I had done these trees in green, then they would have been off in the distance and had a little bit more violet in the greens, a little more haze. So that's what I'm doing there. I had alluded to those uh, in the piece when I finished it. I knew I wanted those trees to be added. Otherwise, these tree screens tend to just sit in a line and they're not really a straight line. They're not, unless they're in a fence row. And this particular case, they were on the edge of the top of a hill or a uh, semi sand dune in the, in the swall. Uh, and behind them, it dipped down into a low area before it came back up. And those trees are on the next ridge over. So then I adjust, start adjusting the colors and the reds. Uh, and the red violets that are underneath these trees. If they're in shadow, but I am adding uh, a little bit more red to those violets so that it's not bright. You'll see in the finish still where I uh, kept the bright light coming in uh, behind these trees and having them backlit. We're getting near the last of the studio work. I'm uh, sharpening some of those areas where the light is coming under the trees and sharpening certain areas that where the tree trunks will be against a brighter light. Uh, you don't want, or I don't want, every part of my image to have sharp edges. Part of my tonalistic approach and trying to keep edges uh, definitions sharp in some areas and fuzzy in a lot. I think that that's one of the things I use to bring the attention of the viewer to a particular place in the painting. So that's what I'm in the process of doing and making those connections of those branches of the trees coming up from the top of this uh, uh, sand dune into the branches that would come down off of this trunk as they create these treetops. So all these little dark areas have been disconnected up to this point, and I'm trying to make those final connections of those tree trunks and the upper limbs and get it more understandable for the viewer to understand that these aren't just clumps of color, but they're actually trees that have different areas of groupings of branches. So that's the finishing process. It's just a sharpening of those edges in certain locations, not everywhere. The trees that I'll add further to the right, the tree trunks will not be as sharp as they are in this area because this is one of the areas that will have that backlight shining through. Remember earlier where I said that I created these wedges? Well, here I'm starting to refine where grasses grow up in an area and there might be a pathway leading up into there. Uh, that is uh, one of those wedges I created and I have just added a little brighter red to some of the tops of some of that greenery that would have been at the bottom. I selected a set of colors that would not be traditional or local green colors because I just like to play with the color palettes and create the suggestion of these plants and using the variation. I could have just as easily kept this in local color and be adding a little brighter green into the green brush that was underneath those trees. 
So I've just opted to keep it in blue violets and red violets and using a little bit brighter red to create that sense of light coming across the top of those yet still in shadow of this tree screen. This is a very important part near the end that many beginners often forget is adding the sky holes or what we call the sky holes the places where the light peeks through canopies in between trees and you can see i'm using some red oranges to do that i'm trying to separate some of those trees that were just large shapes now that i have already connected the trunks of these trees and established those tree trunks earlier and bringing them up in their branches i can now go in here near the end and put some of these really kind of almost highlights but you see this is a red orange on the right hand side where on the left hand side we have that area that i talked about leaving a kind of a bright spot to draw the attention to so by typically the sky holes are a little bit darker than the color that you use on the sky above or behind them so you'll see that those sky holes will really add a lot of interest and separation and that's an important step and i usually do this near the end as well as other artists that i know they tend to put those sky holes in at the last minute Now you can see working over on the left side, I've changed the pastel. I'm uh, moving into some of those uh, trees that are in the background and trying to create just a little bit finer shapes and um, create some more shapes that are more realistic rather than just the, the overall large shape that I stuck them in there with. And so, just like sky holes and light coming through that little bit of a violet will allow me to show and move across some of those darker areas and create a little bit more of a realistic uh, feel and shape to those trees behind the very last step to this is using my finger uh, in this case, it's a gloved hand to just blend in some of those edges so there's uh, a nice transition. So here's what we're looking at when we're done with the still photo. You can see the brighter colors, you can see the shapes, and that's about 10-15%. I hope that gives you some insight. I hope that gives you some insight on how to take a plain air, a plein air painting, I hope that gives you some insight on how to take a plein air painting, bring it back to your studio, and do some finishing touches. On that particular piece, I probably did more than 20%. I might not have. How they determine that 20% is, or 10%, or whatever percentage they say can be uh, done in, uh, or whatever percentage, how they determine whatever percentage can be done not on location, uh, that is a mystery many times. So I hope that you've enjoyed this and we'll have another episode for you. And by all means, hit the subscribe button or the like button so others see this. So until next time, take care and enjoy your painting. Bye-bye.